What's up, y'all? And welcome to Industrialization and Global Integration, Unit 5, Part 6. In this video, we're going to investigate the emergence of the first industrial revolution by looking initially at the second agricultural revolution. The origins of the second agricultural revolution is actually quite similar to the origins of the first agricultural revolution. Both were preceded by colder global temperatures. Now, the Little Ice Age was a period of colder global temperatures beginning around 1350 and lasting till around 1850. These colder temperatures shortened growing seasons, reducing farm productivity, as well as the amount of food available per person. This stressed the human population, leading to famines, starvation, and death. Nothing very good, of course. Which in turn led to necessary innovations to provide new means of producing food for survival. This all fits perfectly with Plato's famous quote that necessity is the mother of all invention. This basic map shows how the different plots of land would have been divided amongst the farmers. Now because more food had been grown during the medieval warm period, an era of modest population growth occurred, and with the cooler temperatures arriving especially in the 1600s, the open field system proved to be inefficient. With less food per person, a higher demand for more food resulted, as well as higher food prices. Now in England, Parliament passed acts that allowed landlords to combine and fence off the common land, ending the ancient feudal system of peasants using that land for farming, fishing, or collecting firewood, for example. Now these laws have been passed since the 12th century, but increased dramatically in the 18th century. Actually, several wealthier peasants supported this since they could sometimes rent the land and make more profit themselves. Landlords earn greater profits due to increased efficiency, for example, through the production of more wool or even more grains. New techniques could also be experimented with, and peasants were often given other land as compensation, although often of less quality and extent. Several farmers and landowners experimented with different crops, applying the ideas and methods promoted through the scientific revolution. The enclosure movement made farming more efficient which meant fewer peasants were needed to farm. As a result, many migrated to the cities, where cheap labor was in ever-creasing demand. Now, moving away from the medieval three-field rotation system, a four-field rotation was pioneered by farmers, namely around Flanders, in Belgium. This was developed in the early 16th century, and later popularized by the British agriculturalist Charles Turnip Townsend in the 18th century. His system rotated the usual crops, such as wheat and barley. Now, since the roots of the turnips were deeper, they didn't necessarily use the same nutrients in the soil. But more importantly, however, this system opened up a fodder crop, or animal crop, allowing livestock to be bred year-round. This was due to clover, that would reintroduce nitrates into the soil, preventing the field from having to be left fallow. This system of crop rotation, where land is usually not left fallow, persist to this day. And we can thank the Little Ice Age for making this all possible. Now, another innovation that revolutionized agriculture was the seed drill that was improved on and perfected in 1701 by Jethro Tull. No, not that one. This guy. Jethro Tull helped make it possible to sow seeds in neat rows, making the germination of the seeds more likely, and also enabling farmers to more easily tend and to cultivate their crops. Bear in mind, the seed drill was not all that new, but once it made its way to Britain especially, the Second Agricultural Revolution really took off. Tull's methods were adopted by many large landowners, and they truly helped form the basis of modern agriculture. Just travel, for example, to Napa Valley in California, that is wine country, mainly because that crop is worth more than, say, figs or dates or other Mediterranean-type crops. These agriculturalists have brought the cultivation of grapes literally down to a science, producing them in exactly the right amounts with the right distance between each row and each vine. And Europe wasn't the only region to massively further the production of food. The United States, with its relatively cheap and vast farmlands, as well as its free society, provided the right environment for innovation. One example was the cotton gin, 
invented by Eli Whitney around 1793, this machine quickly and easily separates the cotton fibers from the seeds, a job previously done by hand. These seeds are used again to grow more cotton, and this simple machine, massively duplicated, led to an immense increase in cotton production as well. Unfortunately, as well as a massive expansion of slavery in the United States South. You see, the machine replaced the demand for slaves to pick out the seeds, but actually increased the demand for slaves to pick the cotton to feed the machines. Another remarkable machine was the horse-drawn mechanical reaper, invented by Cyrus McCormick in 1830. This enabled farmers to harvest more wheat in less time. By using a series of rotating motions, he was able to cut grain much more efficiently. A large spinning wheel brought the grain to a cutting blade and acted like a pair of scissors. The cut grain would go into a compartment at the back of the machine. And in 1835, John Deere invented the steel plow. This allowed farmers to easily plow the new prairie soils as the country moved westward, fulfilling America's dream of manifest destiny, expanding from sea to shining sea. Lighter than the iron plow, Deere's steel plow was much more efficient, as horses could be used. Oxen were slow but strong, horses were faster. Now, since there are a few trees in the Great Plains to build wood fences, a solution was sought after, with a great deal of money waiting for anyone who could solve the problem. And in 1874, Joseph Glidden devised an efficient means of producing barbed wire. This allowed the settlers to stay in the drier western plain states. They had access to water, they kept their livestock on their own land, and kept them from wandering off. Of course, the modern versions of these inventions are much improved, but they are still based on the sophisticated innovations of motivated individuals driven by the realities of a changing world. So now we will segue into the first industrial revolution. And what made this time period so revolutionary was the replacement of human labor with machines, often powered initially through the use of animals. This revolution had its hearth in Britain, and why it began there has everything to do with... Geography. Uh, yeah! Looking at the five themes of geography, we can see some of the reasons why Britain was in the right place, at the right time, with the right resources, and the right conditions. Starting with location, Europe at the time was the core region of the world, with more money and technology than anywhere else. Britain's favorable relative location was a huge advantage. And, as they improved, so did the region around them. As far as human-environmental interaction, the colder temperatures that affected the globe due to the Little Ice Age had pushed Europe into the second agricultural revolution, in which many machines were devised to replace human and animal labor. This started the process of mechanization that would be taken to a greater scale through the first industrial revolution. For place, Britain possessed many valuable natural resources, such as many fast-flowing rivers, which would be extremely valuable for the early factories that were powered through water wheels. And then, with the improvement of steam power in the late 18th century, Britain possessed other materials, from a variety of metals to energy resources like coal. This brings us to the first major factor of production, land. Now, it's not the amount of land that's important. In fact, Britain's relatively smaller land area and compact territorial morphology meant it was cheaper to transport materials from place to place. In this instance, it's what's in the land that is important. To be exact, industrialization began in places like the Midlands of north-central England, with close proximity to resources and ports which facilitated trade. Looking at region, due to the enclosure movement, many peasants were unable to afford to keep their lands and they migrated from the rural regions to the urban ones, in the cities, because that's where jobs could be found. With this massive influx of cheap labor, Britain had the means necessary to run their factories with far less cost. This brings us to the second major factor of production, labor, and especially for the beginning stages of the Industrial Revolution, abundant cheap labor was of paramount importance. And the last theme is movement. Due to Britain's many colonies, there was a cheap influx of raw materials acquired from afar through their merchant marine, and in turn, a plethora of markets they could sell their goods to, all the while protecting their trade routes with the best navy in the world. Britain had a government that was eager to pass pro-business laws and tariffs to support their mercantilist policies. 
For instance, supporting the British East India Company, considered the world's first multinational corporation, established in the year 1600. This quasi-governmental company maintained its own army, navy, and exclusive trading rights throughout many parts of the world until its dissolution in the 1870s. So now, Britain also possessed the third major factor of production, capital, which refers to the goods and revenue used for production. The collective effects of land, labor, and capital enabled Britain to be the first to enter into the Industrial Revolution. The first industry to truly mechanize was the textile or cloth industry. This makes perfect sense in that through the second agricultural revolution, more food and natural fibers were produced than ever before. There were major increases in the production of flax, used for making linen, as well as wool and cotton. With such an overabundance of raw materials, the need to process them into thread and finished textiles was a logical progression. As stated earlier, locational criteria for industrializing include considerations such as proximity to energy sources and raw materials. Since the earliest factories were powered through water wheels, they had to be adjacent to rivers. However, this changed with improvements in technology. The steam engine enabled manufacturers greater choice in where they could locate their factories. It affected production, transportation, and communication. The steam engine had a plethora of uses, such as pumping water from coal mines, as well as powering steamships and locomotives. As you can see in this chart, the impact of distance decay was reduced as tracks were laid down, and as the speeds of trains increased. For instance, travel from London to Manchester in the horse and buggy era of 1750 would take upwards of three days' travel, whereas a century later, that time was reduced to around six hours. This is what time-space compression is all about. The world feels as if it gets smaller as transport and communication technology improves. And certainly the Industrial Revolution diffused first to relatively close places such as the Netherlands, Germany, France, Poland, Italy, and Russia and across the Atlantic to the United States. Wherever industrialization took root, it had a spillover effect on other areas connected by way of transport nodes, along ports, rivers, canals, and rail lines, such as to the Ruhr Valley found in Germany, the most industrially productive region in Europe today. No matter how you look at it, the Industrial Revolution changed the world forever.